Today we're going to be discussing the anatomy of the skin and then once we have a basic understanding of that we're going to go on and work on the diseases and disorders of the skin. Yesterday y'all got to see a little demonstration about microdermabrasion so that give you a little understanding about the skin cells and uh, how to take care of them, how to get rid of wrinkles and things like that. The, the reason we're going to go on into the diseases and disorders is simply to protect ourselves and our client because some of these diseases and disorders, as you discovered, can be contagious or can cause us infections. When we get infections and things like that, we're not able to work on clients without gloves, and some of our services are very difficult with trying to do them with gloves on. The medical branch of science that deals with the study of skin and its nature, structure, functions, diseases, and treatments is dermatology. And a lot of teenagers, and you, you were familiar with dermatology already because a lot of teenagers go to dermatology with the zits and the breakouts. A dermatologist is simply a physician engaged in the science of treating the skin, its structures, functions, and diseases. An esthetician is a specialist in the cleansing, preservation of health and beautification of the skin. And what esthetician is, they train in cosmetology setting just like you do, but they do only skin, like a nail tech does only nails. And it is a technical certificate part of cosmetology if you want to, you know, specialize in skin. Nail tech is also a technical certificate of cosmetology. Cosmetology itself is a diploma and includes all of it. So if you, when you get your cosmetology diploma, then you can go out and work as an esthetician, although you don't have esthetician license, you know, because you've got the license that encompasses all of it. <coughs> the skin is the largest and one of the most important organs of the body. Healthy skin is slightly moist, soft, and flexible. It has a texture that is ideally smooth and fine-grained. Now, remember, we had texture of the hair the coarseness of it, whether it was fine or medium. And skin is the same way. We look at different individuals, and our magnifying light in the facial room is especially helpful with that to see what the texture of the skin is. Healthy skin possesses a slightly acid reaction with good immunity responses to organisms that touch or try to enter it. All right. We're talking about acids such as on the pH scale. Now, you remember we rated the hair, skin, and nails with a pH of 4.5 to 5.5, which is slightly acid. And we know that anything that is not liquid or cannot be liquefied cannot have a pH. So we wonder about how the skin has a pH. But that it's called an acid mantle that coats our skin. And that comes from the secretion or excretions of the glands in the skin being sebaceous gland mostly but also sweat glands. Skin varies in thickness, being thinnest on the eyelids and thickest on the palms and soles. Continued pressure on any part of the skin can cause it to thicken and develop into a callus. The skin of the scalp is constructed similarly to the skin elsewhere on the human body, but the scalp has larger and deeper follicles to accommodate the longer hair of the head. So if you'll take a close look at the scalp, you can get in the magnifying mirror or look, and look at yours or look at somebody else and where the hairs come out and then look on your arms at the hair where they come out and you'll notice the follicles are not as large on other parts of the body as it is the scalp and that's what they're referring to. The skin is composed of two main divisions, the epidermis and the dermis. Which one was she working on yesterday with the microdermabrasion? epidermis. She was not totally removing the epidermis, but she was removing the dead cells and the different stuff we get on there um, through the run of the day or the week or whatever and the products we put on there. So the epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin. This layer is also called the cuticle or scarf skin. What's the outer layer of hair called? Cuticle? It is the thinnest layer of skin and forms a protective covering for the body. Contains no blood vessels but has many small nerve endings. And that's why sometimes we'll walk by something and scrape our skin and it kind of hurts, even may burn a little bit. We look, we think we're going to see blood going everywhere, but there's no blood. But we felt it. So the nerves are there but no blood vessels. The epidermis itself is made up of the stratum corneum 
or horny layer. It is the outer layer of the epidermis. Its scale-like cells are continually being shed and replaced by cells coming to the surface from underneath. These cells are made up of keratin, which is fiber protein that is also the principal component of hair and nails. So our hair, skin, and nails are all protein products, and they're called keratin. When we studied hair, we talked about it being a hard protein, and we were kind of probably comparing it to T-bone steak, you know, and it is a hard protein for that, but it is a fiber protein, and steak naturally is not. Skin now is going to be referred to as a soft type of keratin because it feels a lot softer than the hair. The cells combine with a thin layer of oil to help make the stratum corneum a protective waterproof layer. The stratum lucidum is the clear transparent layer under the stratum corneum. It consists of small cells through which light can pass. Stratum granulosum or granular layer consists of cells that look like distinct granules. These cells are almost dead and they're being pushed to the surface to replace the cells that have been shed from the stratum corneum. The stratum granulosum, excuse me, stratum germinativum, formerly known as the stratum mucosum, might also be referred to as the basal layer. It's the deepest layer of the epidermis. It is composed of several layers of differently shaped cells. The deepest layer is responsible for the growth of the epidermis. Also, our dark skin pigment is contained there, and it's called melanin. It protects the sensitive cells below from the destructive effects of excessive ultraviolet rays of the sun and those from an ultraviolet lamp or tanning bed. Now, I remember yesterday in the demonstration she was talking about uh, the damage that's done by um, tanning beds especially. And if you'll notice, you'll see bloody places right under my skin sometime. And I hung with the tanning beds and the sun, being a real sun worshiper. And the sun has destroyed my stratum germinativum in my arms from my elbow down. I never wear sleeveless tops, so it hadn't got the top of them. And also right through here, I've had, a, had some problems. No, they're not little. Sometimes they'll go up my arm, and um, and uh, I went to a dermatologist with it, and he explained all this to me, which all kind of lights went off, which I knew this. I just didn't want to face it because I like the sun and the tanning bed. But the skin is a miracle substance, just like the rest of our body or a min um, miracle machine, I guess you'd call it. He told me if I would stay out of the sun and keep sunblock on because you know you're going to walk to your car. And even through that part of time, you know she told you all to use the 30 SPF yesterday mm -hmm. on your face. Even though we may not go into the sun to lay out in the sun, we're out there a lot more than we think. Going from class to class, building to building, to the car, to Walmart, wherever we get out. And even riding in the car, we're in the sunlight. And um, mine are a lot better than what they were. It will reform itself after a period of time. But when it destroyed that, it destroyed my protective layer. So now as my uh, skin is fed through my capillaries, it just comes to the surface. So just a little hint to you, if you do the tanning bed thing or lay out in the sun a lot, that's where it gets you later on. These special cells are called melanocytes because they produce melanin, which determines skin color. The dermis, then, is the underlying or inner layer of the skin. It is also called the derma, the corium, the cutis, or the true skin. It's a highly sensitive layer of connective tissue that is about 25 times thicker than the epidermis. Within its structure, there are numerous blood vessels, lymph vessels, nerves, sweat glands, oil glands, and hair follicles, as well as our erector pili muscles that work in connection with the hair follicles and papillae, which are small cone-shaped projections of elastic tissue that point upward into the epidermis. The dermis is made up of two layers, the papillary or superficial layer and then the reticular or deeper layer. The papillary layer is the outer layer of the dermis directly beneath the epidermis. This is where you find the papillae, which are small cone-shaped elevations at the bottom of the hair follicles. 
Some of these papillae contain looped capillaries and others contain small structures called tactile, cor tactile corpuscles with nerve endings that are sensitive to touch and pressure. This layer also contains some melanin, so it's not all contained in the stratum germinativum. The reticular layer is the deeper layer of the dermis that supplies the skin with oxygen and nutrients. It contains the following structures within its network. Fat cells. Now, I want to call your attention to fat cells because although it contains some of the fat cells, it is not the fatty layer of skin. It contains blood vessels, lymph vessels, oil glands, sweat glands, hair follicles, and erectopole muscles. We know it contains blood vessels. If we'd have scraped our arm just a little harder, it went into the epidermis and there would have been bleeding. 